Herzlich willkommen zum Draußentester. Heute nehme ich euch mit auf eine Zeitreise. Und nicht nur das. Wir wechseln gleich den Ort und die Sprache. Denn wir treffen einen der größten Folksänger, Gitarristen, Poeten und politischen Aktivisten der vergangenen Jahrzehnte. Bruce Coburn aus Kanada. Ein echtes Ereignis, eine wahre Legende. Seine Musik kann in verschiedene Genres eingeordnet werden, darunter Folk Music, Rock, World Music und Jazz. Coburns Texte sind oft poetisch und beackern ein großes Spektrum an Themen wie soziale Gerechtigkeit, Umwelt, Glauben, Spiritualität und die Beziehungsfähigkeit der Menschen. Zu seinen wohl bekanntesten Liedern gehören »If I Had a Rocket Launcher«, in dem er über die Gewalt in Mittelamerika singt, und »Wondering Where the Lions Are«, ein optimistischer Song, der von der menschlichen Naturverbundenheit berichtet. Ich habe Bruce Coburn ein paar Mal treffen dürfen und einmal beim Abschlusskonzert seiner Europatournee habe ich ein Gespräch mit ihm aufzeichnen können. Am 12. November 2013 in London. Und dieses Gespräch, das könnt ihr euch jetzt anhören. Hier ist er, Bruce Coburn. Bruce, what does a typical week on a tour look like for you? Is there enough time for you to, to enjoy the places that you've traveled to? Or? Not normally, no. I mean, the usual pattern is we get a day off each week. Um, but this tour has been particularly uh, intense. Uh, to me, a day off, the definition of a day off is a day when you can do your laundry, right? So if you can't do your laundry, it's not a day off. You're traveling or there's some other stuff going on that, that makes it not a rest day. So uh, this tour has had no days off, basically, for the past three weeks. It's almost over now. Uh, so we had a day off after, I guess, a real day off the first The, the day after we arrived in Germany, we played a show and then we had a day off. Mm -hmm. But that's at the beginning of the tour. And then, <laughs> so after that, it's been pretty steady work or travel. So it, it, but it's okay. It's gone very well, actually. But, uh, but um, so this day in London is, is, is actually more or less a day off. If I had to do laundry because I was staying longer, <laughs> I would be able to do it. <laughs> now, we're in London right now, and this is the end of your European tour. Are you happy with how it went so far? It all went quite well. I was I was actually really pleased. Some of the places, have, uh, historically, for instance, in Berlin, I have, haven't generally done that well. In the 80s I did, but then there, there, I've been there a few times since when we didn't get much of a turnout. But it was good this time. It was a small place, but it, there was enough people, and they, they were very enthusiastic. Uh, so that worked well. And um, we played a couple of places in Spain that I've never been to before and that worked out well. So uh, I think the shows have gone very well and, uh, you know, it's, um, I, I always feel like this at the end of a European tour, like I want to, to spend more time here and do more. Mm -hmm. But once I get back to North America, then there's so many things to do there that it, it, it's hard to get motivated to come back. Not emotionally because I love, I love coming to Europe, but, But just to, in, in practical terms, to kind of make it happen, um, it's, it always takes longer than I want it to. So I'm, at, I'm kind of at that point in the tour where I'm starting to think, yeah, it's too bad, it's almost over. And I'm, I'll be glad to go home, but at, at the same time, I wish I could stay here for another two months and cover more. The lyrics in your songs are very important and, and dominant. When you perform in front of an audience, whose native language is not English and who might not be able to understand all the details in your poetry. How does that affect, if at all, your performance and particularly the reception of your songs? Uh, it's a bit strange at times. It's, it's less strange in Germany because people are very familiar with English language music, at least English language pop music. And uh, most people are pretty good English speakers, most of, the, most of my audience anyway. Um, in Spain, it's a bit of a different issue because you've, it's rare to find someone who speaks a lot of English. And um, I worry about that a little bit. It's like I have to plan the shows so that people who aren't understanding any of the words can still find something to get into. 
in the music and in the in the feeling that comes through and they 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 did it worked okay but there's i I put a little more emphasis on the instrumental side of things and you know up tempo things and so on that that people who weren't being who weren't able to follow the lyrics would be able to enjoy um, but it is a challenge i had <laughs> one time i remember playing a show in italy i've done quite a lot of touring in italy over the years and on one occasion we played in somewhere i forget where it was but a guy came and talked to me after the show and he the show had included call it democracy if i had a rocket launcher a number of those uh, you know of other kind of fairly intense political quote unquote songs and and he said to me you know i don't understand any word any of your words at all but your music is so soothing to me it's like chamomile tea <laughs> you know, it's like what what am i doing here <laughs> and and so there, that's one end of the spectrum right like they 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 don't get it at all but there's something to enjoy there and you got to be grateful for that even though it isn't what i'm hoping for mm -hmm. uh but um but then you know on the other end of the spectrum is people who've uh, either whose english is good enough to follow what's being said um and or who have lived with the songs for a period of time and have kind of paid attention and and and, uh, be, and understand them, uh, and that's of course more rewarding for me when I when I play for that audience because a lot of my own heart goes into the lyrics. Now on this tour in Europe, you are playing all by yourself alone. Does this have an effect on how flexible you are regarding changing your playlist for each concert? In theory, I'm very flexible, but in fact, I, when I stumble on something that works, I tend to stick with it for a while. Uh, so most of the German shows were similar. I, I, the songs would change very slightly from night to night, but the basic structure of the show would be similar. I, I changed it a bit for Spain. Like I said, I, I put more instrumental stuff in and, um, and, and fewer of the... The, the sort of more word-oriented songs that, that you really need to understand the words to appreciate. Uh, so I, I've tried to keep it melodic and energetic and, and so on for Spain. But, uh, but they, they weren't so different, really. How would you describe your audience? Who comes to see your shows? Um, it's, a, it's a mixture. I never really know uh, uh, from one tour to the next who's going to show up. Uh, um, it's... In general, I suppose there are people who were uh, in college or just out of college in the 80s, like late 70s, early 80s. Uh, it's mostly, most of us become attracted to particular types of music at that point in our lives. And um, so the people who were at that point that tuned into me are still coming to the shows and they've, they, they buy my records and they've followed me over the years. Um, But they've also bred another generation of kids, and, and this is something that I would have never expected. But uh, there's a lot, a lot of younger people who come to the shows who grew up with my music because their parents listen to it. And uh, I find that very interesting because I would never go to a show of my parents' music willingly. Now, even when I was young, I didn't like it. You know, I'd, uh, they they listened to things like The Sound of Music or the, you know, the... The um, you know the, the that type of sort of the pop music of the 40s, 30s, so on, and to me that wasn't interesting at all. So the idea that young people would actually come to see the shows because their parents made them listen to my stuff is is actually quite interesting, and, and I'm grateful for it because you know you don't want to think that your audience is getting old and dying with you. But in fact, though, the majority of them probably do fit that last description. If you compare your audiences around the globe, how do they differ? There's not such a great difference. People, I mean, you, you notice a slight difference in the style of the way people applaud. or the, I mean, the German audiences will, will very quickly, if they like the show, they'll start clapping in unison very quickly at the end, right? faster than anyone in... I mean, that happens sometimes elsewhere, but it, not, not as readily. 
uh, that's that's a difference. But really, in in a in a real human way, there's not such a great difference. I think the music. I mean, my songs attract a certain type of listener. That that it's not so culturally dependent. It's uh, the people who are interested in my songs are people that are willing to think about the, their entertainment. That don't want to just be spoon fed something. Um, they're people that. Uh, are interested in the concepts that are in the songs and so on. And I think the, that the, the common ground there transcends borders and cultures. Uh, other, I mean, once you get past the language issue and, and uh, whatever cultural differences might constitute an obstacle, then you find that like, you know, the, the people in Japan that pay attention to my songs are, aren't so different from the people in Germany or Canada that do. It's just, I mean, they're different in numbers, <laughs> but, but um, you know, they they're interested in, in the imagery and in the in the the, the feeling that comes through the songs. The, 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 at different times, it's not so much geographical, but maybe period related. Um, people have uh, have uh, taken different aspects of what I do. Uh, it, or emphasized those different aspects in the 70s because I was writing more internal or interior directed spiritual kind of stuff. The people who were interested then were people who related to that. Then when I got more political, quote unquote, I keep putting that in quotation marks because I, I think I have to, but um, the, the, the people that got interested in that were not necessarily drawn to the spiritual content of the earlier songs but but they're still willing to listen to it. And in some cases, there is a crossover so that people, I think that, I think to have someone from the Christian community as it, as it then was for me, that come into, you know, start talking about, about political issues. Uh, at the time I did that, you know, there weren't very many people doing that in the same, speaking to the same audience. And there were people in that audience that were very hungry for that kind of idea because they had the concerns of themselves, but nobody was talking to them about it. So all of a sudden, there were songs that, that they could relate to that, that spoke for them in some way. And, and that's what attracted the attention of most of the people in Europe, I think, for me. There was, uh, back in the day, I remember running into somebody in the early 80s, before the Stealing Fire album came out, which was the one that got the most attention, um, there was an old song from the mid-70s called Lord of the Starfields, and, there, and I, I met somebody from Germany that knew that song, um, who was, you know, oh, yeah, you're that guy that sang Lord of the Starfields, and in Italy that was a big song. Um, but, you know... Then, then when Stealing Fire came out, the German audiences really took to that, as did the American audiences. But the Italians didn't like it because they liked the acoustic stuff better. So they, they didn't want to hear about all this politics, and they didn't want to hear electric guitar. You know, they, I, I, the audience sort of dropped off a bit in Italy because of that stuff, whereas it grew in other places. So you get these, you get these regional differences, but I think the core audience, the ones who keep on buying the records and keep on coming to the shows... Are people who are are not so um, whose interest goes beyond just the, the the confines of their own culture. After spending decades on the road, what motivates you today to go on tour? What is the fascination about performing live? I think the songs come into their own when there's a live audience. Um, I mean, I can sit in my room and play the songs and I feel good playing them or I don't, depending on how well I do. But um, but it is satisfying to some extent for me to just sit and play the songs to myself. But it, really, they need another set of ears to, to be on the receiving end, to be complete. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's as a songwriter, I want to play the songs for people. As a uh, As a person who's really kind of shy and I I don't really like I mean I like the attention to be honest but I but I find it frightening to be to go on stage 
So, you know, I don't really like that, but it's the only way I'm going to get people to hear the songs, so I have to do it. And that, that was the way I started out, and it hasn't really changed. I mean, I, I'm used to it, so it's not as, as big a deal as it was when I started out. But originally I thought, you know, I'll write these songs and other people will sing them and, you know, that'll be fine. But then it, it became clear quite quickly that no one else was going to sing them, <laughs> so it had to be me. And uh, so, and I, I like playing the guitar anyway. I mean, the, the guitar is, it became a, a very important element in my life in my teens when I first started playing, and, uh, and it remains that. If I get away from it for too long, it's, I, I start losing my balance a little bit. We talked about touring alone. Why did you not bring along a band this time, as you used to do a few years ago? I still do when I can afford it. But it's, it's, it's not feasible for me to bring a band to England to play in the size, or to, to Europe in general, and to play in the sizes of venues that we're playing. Uh, to the numbers of people that are coming out. I mean, you know, we can play in Berlin to 200 people, and it's quite satisfying as a solo thing, but it, it, it wouldn't pay for a band. And that's really what it comes down to, because I like touring with a band. I, I, I like playing solo, too, for different reasons, but, but the band is more fun for me because it's less stressful, right. because there's other people doing part of the work. Um, But uh, I toured with a band in the summer in North America doing festivals and so on uh, this summer. But uh, And I would love to bring that. It was just a trio with, with uh, Gary Craig on drums and Jenny Scheinman on violin. It was really great, great energy, and the music really worked well. I'd love to bring that to Europe, but I can't convince anyone to pay me enough. <laughs> Now, in 2011, the Canada Post Corporation created a Bruce Coburn stamp to honor your lifetime of achievement. And this stamp presents you as an icon of Canada. How does it feel to have your own stamp? Um, it, feels, it felt pretty good, actually. It was, it was sort of odd. I mean, you sort of feel like, shouldn't I be dead? <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but no, it was quite an honor, actually. I, I think those, those things that, uh, I mean, they wouldn't be coming to me if it weren't for the, the, if it weren't for what I do. I mean, I, if I were just a regular citizen going to an office to work in the daytime, um, nobody would be putting me on a stamp or giving me medals or any of that sort of stuff. But I, what I like about, about the Order of Canada, uh, and, and the postage stamp, uh, is that it's not directly business related. It's not like getting a Juno Award or, or in the States it would be a Grammy, which I've never gotten, but, but the Canadian equivalent is the Juno Awards and, and I have lots of those, but, um, but that to me is less significant than the kind of the, the honors that are away from the business itself, like that, that speak more to uh, some way in which The, my own people uh, view me and have made me um, kind of welcome in their lives in some way. And that feels really good. It's like, I mean, people buying the records does that too. I mean, or people listening to the music and coming to shows. I feel like in some way there's, there's a, uh, some of the quality of a family about that um, emotionally. But, and the same applies to those medals but the, but a, but a, like business awards i don't feel that way about so much it's mm -hmm. like okay so i sold more records than somebody else or i you know I, someone decided i'm the best folk singer well what the hell is that you know like how can there be a best anything in the in the arts you know mm -hmm. like you know is picasso a better painter than juan miro you know i no <laughs> but you know somebody will think he is because they like it better but But uh, or or because his paintings cost more or whatever. But but uh, it's it's not a it's not realistic. But the, the any anything that measures the degree to which uh, you're accepted into some into people's hearts it, it does count. How would you describe your relation to Canada? Are you proud to be a Canadian citizen? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what it means, but the answer is yes. 
um, yeah, I do feel, I feel like a Canadian. I don't live in Canada now. I live in San Francisco uh, as of the last four years, but um, because I have a wife and a baby in San Francisco, but, it, but, uh, but I feel very much a Canadian and I, f and, and I feel like the, uh, what I grew up with, uh, as a, as a Canadian, the, the, the values I was given, uh, the sense of um, my place in the cosmos in a way that comes with being a citizen of a, a huge but not very powerful country, um, I think is very valuable and I, and I, I, I cherish those values and, and that sense of perspective. I think, uh, I mean, it's, you, you always make, it, make whatever you will out of what you're given. We come into the world with a certain set of baggage and that gets added to by our upbringing. And it, and in the end, it comes down to what you make of it as a person, as a human being, once you mature. But that being said, I think the background part of it does matter. And uh, it matters to me personally, at least, anyway. It, it would not make the difference between me judging someone bad or good because they come from a particular place. But um, but for myself, I feel like that Canada made me who I am to a great extent, and I appreciate that. So do you miss home every once in a while? Do you miss Canada since you live out on the West Coast in the United States? I miss the weather. <laughs> San Francisco, if you, if you have to be stuck with one kind of weather, it's got the best kind. And it, it goes from, I don't know, you know, 10 degrees to 20 degrees, basically. It's always in that range. It's uh, sunny most of the time, but not always. There's sometimes there's fog and sometimes there's rain. But um, but it's if like I said, if you have one climate only, it's it's a good one. But I miss the snow. I miss I miss looking out the window and and knowing that I have to confront something in terms of weather. Like there's something happening out there that I have to deal with, and it's that's stimulating to me. And it, and it always was growing up. There's snow out there. It's cold. You got to dress for it. You got to be prepared to be active. It wakes you up. It gives you, it kind of slaps you around in a good way. And uh, I don't get that in California. But that's really the only thing I miss, uh, other than my family in Canada and connections with people that are much more difficult to maintain now uh, at that distance. But um, but uh, San Francisco is a good place. And living in the United States. The United States is insane. I don't think it's alone in that. You know, I think the other countries could could fit that description also. But uh, it's a it's a very weird place <laughs> in terms of uh, it being a, an incredible mixture of uh, very positive energy and and uh, and very dark, um, very dark prejudices and very dark willful ignorance and, and so on. I think that's a human issue, not so much an American issue, but it's, it's very present in the United States and more noticeable because, more noticeable than in, than in Canada because this, the, I'm not sure why actually, I was going to, I thought I had a, a reason why it's like that, but I'm not sure what it is. It has to do with the, the history and, and the place in the world and so on. But, um, And with with a generally bad level of education, I think too. I think that at least my experience of Canadian education taught me a lot of stuff. I wasn't a very good student, but I learned a lot of stuff, and I, I a lot more about a lot of things than most of my peers in, in the United States seem to know. Uh, just about, I mean, facts about history or about geography or general information that that. Uh, that gives me a broader view of things than, than a lot of the people I meet in the States. And it's not universally true in Canada. Of course, I can, you can meet Canadians that don't pay any attention to what, anything in the next block of their city. But, um, but I think in general, the awareness of, of other cultures and of the world is, uh, is greater in Canada. And Canada 
possibly because it was built more on consensus than on revolution, uh, is it, it provides an atmosphere in which people are more inclined to, to try to get along. Uh, the, the U.S. is very polarized. You know, you're a right-wing Christian in the U.S., and you have to hate the people that don't agree with you. And you're a white person in the South, and you have to hate black people. And if you're a black person in the inner cities and then anywhere in the United States, you have to hate white people. And it's kind of, it's like the law or something. And it's not universal. It's easy to find exceptions to these things. Very easy, but but they're, they're all the same. And it's it's a more volatile um, kind of situation because of these, because of this entrenched ignorance and and, or what to me looks like that and, um, and the kind of violent history that, people celebrate. Um, you know, in Canada, we honor our war dead, but they're dead, and we, we'd rather have them there, uh, and not be dead. But in the states, they just honor war. <laughs> I think, you know, or at least they, I mean, I'm, I'm making too big a generalization out of these things, but it's, in some way it's true. A few months ago, you visited Afghanistan, where your brother served in the Canadian Army. Now, this must have been a very unique and special experience for you. It was. I've been in war zones before uh, in, in other parts of the world, but never with Canadians. Uh, even in, we, I went to Kosovo, and, and where we did have Canadians Canadian troops, but at the time I went, that was pretty much over, and the the uh, the Serbs were, you know, being put down, and the and the Albanians, the Kosovo Albanians, were coming home, and it was a kind of celebratory atmosphere. But but uh, you know, and and the troops there, the UN troops that we met mostly that were Italian Carabinieri, who had the best uniforms. The most stylish uniforms of any any group I've ever seen, and they were. I mean, I, Carabinieri in Italy are scary, but in Kosovo they were great because they were they were our friends in Kosovo, right? But but uh, um, in uh, anyway, they, that it, it was very interesting to me to be uh, among all these young Canadians who were smart. I, I they were smarter than I thought they would be, and and more worldly aware. More aware of the, their their uh, their situation in the broader context than I imagined they would be. They still believed in the mission, as you can imagine you'd want to if you were in their position. Uh, they weren't cynical about it, and and that that was kind of endearing too. Like that, yeah, you're here. You know, we're here in Afghanistan. We're we're basically playing what to me seemed like a loser's game because you know, okay. In theory, you could, by subjugating the Taliban, by by or erasing them from the scene, and by creating an atmosphere in which children could grow up in a state of peace, you could offer uh, the possibility of a, a kind of development that I don't think we'll see. But even from from the perspective of the official military line, that was going to take a whole generation. They needed 30 years to do what they were doing, to accomplish their mission. And it was impossible for me to imagine any democratic government in the West sustaining that kind of thing for 30 years. I mean, it just won't happen. Even, even I mean, the will wouldn't be there, and the money wouldn't be there. And, and that, of course, is how it's turned out. The, the, you know, the military folks were very fond of our current government because it was conservative and because it was promoting sort of military things. But now that You know, now we're, now we're on to oil and other things, and they, they don't care about the military anymore. They're cutting the budgets back and basically screwing these people that they were, you know, a couple of years ago were supporting so vigorously. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, I mean, personally, I think, uh, I think a country needs an army. I think that in, in the world that we live in, recognizing human nature for what it is, you have to have the ability to defend yourself. And you have to have a force that can respond to crises uh, quickly of whatever kind, whether it's you know floods or, or an assault from some, somewhere. Um, and if you're going to have people that are going to devote their lives to that kind of thing, they should have the best 
equipment they can have. They should have the best training they can have, and so on. I mean, the, a perfect scenario to me is, in my, <laughs> perhaps this is naive from your point of view, but uh, but when I look at Switzerland, where it's all about the militia, it's all about everybody being prepared to to, to play their part. I would like Canada to be like that, but we're not going to be because it's it's a different kind of country than Switzerland and. You know, it's, it's very hard to imagine how we would make that work. But uh, the next best thing is to have a, a professional army that, that is under the control of the government, that, that sees itself as part of the citizenry, um, as part of a team that includes everybody else in the country. Uh, the army in Nicaragua, the Sandinista army, was like that. The, the army in Mozambique was not like that. The, the our army is in... Lots of other places are not like that. They see themselves as an elite. They're, uh, you know, they're repressive or whatever. They're, 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 they can't be trusted. Um, and I think the U.S. is somewhere in the middle of all of that. There are elements in there that can't be trusted at all, and there's other elements that are, that are uh, um, well-intentioned and, and have a sense of, of the country's honor and the Constitution's honor. Uh, but... Uh, but that being said, all of that, the, the mission was, was impossible, and we're well out of it. We're not completely out of it. We're still there in the training wall. But as we pull out, as, as the NATO forces pull out of Afghanistan, it's just falling right back to what it was, and, it, and it's going to be an even bigger bloodbath than it was before. And the Taliban will probably end up in the ascendancy, and... You know, maybe not. Maybe something. Maybe there'll be a, you know, somebody else charismatic that surprises us. Uh, that's more uh, open-minded than those guys. But that, that whole, you know, I, I, th I think okay. Even if you imagine um, that that you could get that thirty years and have uh, have kids grow up expecting peace. I think it would take more than one generation, first of all, because if you look at Northern Ireland, it's taken 900 years and they're still not over it. But, but uh, they're, uh, the, but I mean, history doesn't forget. But, uh, but let's say that that would work. Um, you're still dealing with a culture that, I mean, okay, you. you you grow up in peace. You expect to be able to do business in a reasonable way, etc. And you know, we expect a whole set of uh, characteristics to, to define that situation. But um, you, if you grow up in a culture that has no no history of democracy, that has no uh, no history of anything other than a sort of warlordism, one way or another, um, and you grow up in a country or in a culture that devalues women. That um, that devalues modern thinking or modern anything other than material things. Um, I, I don't I don't really quite get why we're supporting that. I mean, from a human point of view, I do. Like the individual people deserve a break, and they deserve freedom from oppression and freedom from the expectation of violence, and and the women deserve freedom from the expectation of having acid thrown in their face if they learn to read and this sort of stuff. I mean, these are hideous things that no one should have to confront. But, uh, but looking at it culturally, like we're, you know, that is the culture. And unless you get enough people in the culture that are saying, we don't want that anymore, then you have no chance of changing it. And I, I don't, there aren't enough Afghans saying that, I don't think. Maybe after 30 years there would be. Maybe that would be enough to change that part of it. But it's true. I mean, you look at, it's not just Afghanistan. It's, a, it's, it's Bangladesh. The same stuff happens. Um, and, and on top of that, you have the, the exploitation of sweatshops and all the rest of it. Afghanistan, I don't think we have to worry about that. <laughs> but not for a long time anyway. But, but uh I mean, there's a lot that's admirable about that kind of rugged, individualistic chaos that seems to characterize a place like Afghanistan. It's like it's like the old West, or you know, where 
a man can go out and be a man and but but they you have to know the terms and and you know they're not terms that I could readily embrace you know to if I, if I were to put myself in that culture so I, I yeah I have to say no I'm, we don't need that. The world doesn't need it. The world doesn't need people going around throwing acid at other people. Could you tell me more about your visit to Canadian soldiers serving in Afghanistan? Well, uh, the surprise was how well I could relate to these young people. Um, I mean, they kind of felt like my kids, in a way. Uh, not all of them were that young, but but the majority certainly were. And there was a sense of uh, professionalism and a sense of intelligence about what they were doing that was very impressive. And I, that that's what I came away with. I mean, I, with great respect for for their choices and for their commitment to their mission. Um, the, the fact that the mission may be a little shaky um, or a lot shaky doesn't take away from the... Uh, the ability to respect them as people who have made the, who, a choice to be in that situation are doing the best thing they can with it mm. um, and, 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 and are not unaware of the humanitarian side of things. Like they're not out there slaughtering civilians. We, you know, there, there have been incidents, in, in, as there would be in any war, where people do bad things. And, I mean, war is by definition full of bad things. But... Uh, But beyond the, the predictable bad things, there's, there are exceptional bad things and where, where people murder other people or they rape and pillage and they do things that we don't condone or can't condone. Uh, and, but I think the Canadian involvement in the places it's been has been about as free of that stuff as you could ever imagine uh, people in that situation being. And uh, so, you know, it's easy to be proud of them for that. Um, but you know, I still disagree with the with the mission. I think I think, yeah, we need we need those people, and we need them to be well equipped and well trained, and they should be protecting our borders, and they should be uh, making sure that you know, and they sh they should be available to help. For instance, um, my brother is out of the army now because he's he turned sixty and it's a mandatory retirement, uh, but he's a doctor, and one of The, th the next thing he did after Afghanistan, he was in, in Kandahar for six months, and then he was home for uh, for a few months, and then they had the big earthquake in Haiti, and he went straight to Haiti with the Canadian forces, and he spent another four or five months there. Uh, and there, there was no military, or no, no aggressive component to that at all. It was strictly aid to earthquake victims. So we had, to have a military that can react that way to world situations as well as to you know the requirements of defense i think is a really good thing and and uh, and another reason to be proud of them but uh and proud of ourselves i suppose is really what I, what that means as, as canadians because we have that kind of army you know uh mexico doesn't have that kind of army I, I, maybe germany does now but it didn't used to <laughs> so uh you know I, it's i mean It's about civilization, I guess, eh? and the recognition that there are certain things that are required to to live in a state that we would call civilized. Uh, and it's always a delicate balancing act, and there's always somebody that's too much out for themselves or just doesn't get it, or, you know, th there's always problems. But the ability to address these problems in a reasonable way is one of the things that defines civilization. And We stumble and we we generally uh, kind of grope our way through a, a kind of darkness to get to maintain that state. But but you know I I want to see it maintained. Uh, I doubt that it will be, frankly. But I think we're headed for a period of major chaos. But uh, but we can hope. You've written some really, in my mind, beautiful Christian uh, songs and lyrics. You still are a Christian. Um, you have been a Christian most of your life. Do you pray? 
in a form. Um, uh, yeah, I guess the, the short answer is yes. I, I don't know if I think of myself as a Christian at this point because I feel like the, the imagery of Christianity is representative of something broader, deeper, uh, and and I I'm after that. I want I want that. I want a relationship with God that is more direct than going through a church and going through the. I uh, mean, uh, you know, this is the result of uh, involvement in kind of post Jungian thought and and work. But um, I to to put it in Jungian terms, I kind of see the figure of Christ as a as a sort of collective animus figure, the male principle of the soul and and the our our way to God is is maybe it is through that collective animus thing, or maybe it's through the personal equivalent of that. For me it feels more like the personal thing is what matters right now. Um, and I feel that that's a deeper take on things than what I had when I thought of myself as a Christian, when I was just dealing with the, um, with an attempt to have a relationship with what I imagined Jesus to be. Um, but other people might disagree with that, of course, but that's where I'm at. And, and, um, but I think that my relationship with God is the most important thing in my life. Um, so do I pray? I do. I do, but I also do. Um, I work with dreams, with with the Jungian archetypes, and um, and I regard that as a kind of prayer, too, because it's it's an attempt, as is prayer, to to maintain a relationship with God or or be available to the relationship that's offered. Throughout your life, you have visited numerous places of crisis and war, and you have written about these experiences extensively in your songs. But things on a global level do not seem to improve. Rather, the opposite is the case. Does this frustrate you particularly as an artist? It's not so much frustrating as depressing. <laughs> you know, it's like frustration would be, frustration results from thinking you can do something about it and failing or, or feeling like you're being kept from acting in, in the way that will work. I, I don't really see anything working. I, I you know, it, it's not, and it, depressing isn't even really it either because it, it, at the same time as there's, the, there are elements that could be depressing, it's also kind of exciting. It's like a big, unfolding saga to watch all this stuff going on and you know I, I've I've always liked movies with a little violence in them <laughs> you know and, and this is this is life right but uh, but I worry for my daughter from from my and my grandchildren uh, that's I really worry for them because I don't like the way things are going and I don't it doesn't look good I mean on on many different fronts on the on with respect to the environment with respect to antibiotic resistant bacteria with respect to uh, political chaos and and economic chaos and all these things everything is kind of in a very volatile state it feels to me uh, i don't want to predict that everything is going to collapse although in my heart i kind of feel like it will and i and that that worries me a lot What kind of world is my, my young daughter, the two-year-old, going to grow up in? Thank you, Bruce Coburn. Das war unser Gespräch mit Bruce Coburn, dem kanadischen Rockpoeten. Dieses Gespräch haben wir in London geführt, und zwar am 12. November 2013. Der nächste Draußentester kommt bestimmt. Bis dahin. Tschüss und ciao, ciao.